morning. Scripture reading this morning will come from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26. That's Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Good morning. I pray that each of you have had a good holiday week, and that you enjoyed time with friends and time with, with family, uh, and that your turkey didn't go to your thighs. I thought I had a pretty good poem last week, but obviously many of you didn't like it. So I have decided to stick with what I know uh, and just start building cars again. You know, there are little things in life that affect me. I, you know, I know I'm a big guy, and when you see a big guy, you, you know, a lot of people, you know, think, well, he's, you know, he's just tough, and he's just rough, and he doesn't have a heart, and, and things like that. I, I'm just a big softy, uh, and there are little things that touch me, and I don't know if you saw what went on just a moment ago when the kids went to Kingdom Kids, uh, but I just wanted to sit down and cry. <laughs> You know, the Bible says, let the little children come unto me. And you know, that's for all of us. And that's the way God wants us, is the innocence as a child, uh, that we're so dependent on our, on our Father in heaven that we're going to do his will. Uh, and to see Andrew come over and to take a, a, a little one with him to go to Kingdom Kids, uh, I just thought, well, let's just have the invitation song now. <laughs> Because I don't think that we can learn a more valuable lesson than what we just saw uh, in the innocence of a precious child who puts his trust uh, in what's going to be taught to him downstairs uh, and the excitement that, that was on his face to be able to take somebody with him to do that. Uh, and I think there's a lesson there for all of us uh, to have that kind of excitement about who we are as Christians and to want to take somebody with us uh, to be a part of that. Uh, and to going beyond the idea of just kingdom kids, let's take that a little farther. And how about the idea of taking somebody with us to heaven? You know, I want to take some folks with me. Uh, I don't take a lot of folks with me. And I want to make sure that I'm doing the things in my life that are going to help me be uh, an example to, to extend that hand to say, hey, you want to go with me? You know, do you want to go with me? And, and I hope that, that we do that in our lives. In our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 16, a verse that should be very familiar with all of us, and we have given for us this idea of this question that there's really no answer to. It says, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, you say that to a lot of people in the world today, and a lot of people will start coming up with ideas of, of things that are important in their life. And, and, you know, whether you're talking about friends, whether you're talking about family, whether you're talking about physical possessions, I can tell you this, from studying the Bible, not just from, from being a preacher, but on my personal study of the Bible, there is nothing that I have found that the Bible says that we can give that is in exchange for our soul. Our soul is the most important thing that we have. And that we need to ensure that we're living our life, that we're taking care of our soul. Now some of you, when you gathered around multiple tables, maybe through the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, some of you were blessed to have to go from one house to this house to this house. And I remember those days when you try to keep everybody in the family happy and, and finally you realize it's just impossible to do that. Uh, that is you there that, you know, you, you're thinking, well, I can't eat all that much because I got to take care of my body. And I remember most of you were probably sitting at that table thinking about my poem, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> it was in the back of your mind uh, of what was going to stick to the rest of your body when it was all over. Uh, but of taking care of our body. And I think it's okay and I think it's good to take care of our body. 
You know, I know there are those that kind of take the Bible to an extreme to where it says bodily exercise profits little. But I also believe that we're to take care of our bodies so that we can be of service to God in the kingdom. That's our number one motivation uh, in taking care of our bodies. And here we think about the idea of taking care of our bodies spiritually. And this morning, where is your body spiritually? Are you taking care of your spiritual body that God has given you? That body that the Bible says, fear not the one that can destroy the body, but fear the one that can destroy both body and soul in judgment. The devil has put things in this world, horrible things in this world that can destroy our bodies. Cancer is a horrible thing. Disease is a horrible thing. Old age destroys the body. The older you get, you just can't do things the way you used to. And we know that if we're blessed to live 70, 80, 90 years, what a blessing that was to have that much time here on this earth. But in regards to eternity, that's a very small, minute part of our existence. So we think about the spiritual nature of man and that it's going, as the Bible says, it's going to live on for an eternity. And that's the part that we need to take care of in our life now because that's the only thing that matters. So therefore, there is nothing worth me giving up for my soul. Hollywood has glamorized the idea through movies, the idea of, well, someone sold their soul to the devil. And every one of those movies that I've had the misfortune of watching you always find in the end that the movie generally switches gears to, to where they realize the great mistake that they made and they try to reverse that situation. And Hollywood has turned that into, uh, into uh, you know, multiple movies. But you know, the reality of that is there's going to come a day where if you've sold your soul for anything in this earth, and what I mean by that is if there's anything that you cherish more in this world than your very soul, there's going to come a day of reckoning where you're going to wish you could do anything to turn that around to where you made your soul, your spiritual health, your priority all of your life so that you can be right with God when you stand before him on the great day of judgment. Because when you sum it all up, that's the moment that means the most in all of our lives. That's the defining moment of our very existence here on this earth. In the book of, of Ecclesiastes, there Solomon writes about the, all the things that he has gone through in life. And he talks about all of it being vanity. All of it being useless. And he goes on to answer the question, well, what's the whole duty of man? And Solomon sums it up right. And Solomon puts it in words that I think we need to hear more often. And where Solomon says, I've had the money and I've had the possessions and I've had all of this that God has given me through wisdom. But all of that is useless. The only thing that matters now that I'm at the end of my life is fear God, keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Is that you today? This morning, I want us to talk about the idea of where Jesus, in the beginning of this, says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Are you following Jesus Christ today? Only you can answer that. To me... Many appear to be following Christ. Those that I know personally, those that I know in a relationship beyond uh, the relationship that many of us have of coming together here in this building as a, con as a congregation of the Lord's church, you seem to be following after Jesus Christ. And that's a great thing. You know, it's a great thing that you made the effort to be here today to worship God. But are you following after him every day of your life? Folks, you cannot, and I don't mean to be negative, but I don't want to be real in some of the messages that we share together. We got to be real and to understand that if the only time that we give God anything in our life is coming together once a week on a Sunday morning, if we think that's good enough, I think we've misunderstood scripture. 
that God says, take up thy cross and follow me. In other passages, he'll tell them to take up a cross daily and follow me. We need a life that is a direct representation that says, in all that I say, in all that I do, I'm going to follow after him. But guess what? None of us are perfect, are we? I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Our elders, they're not perfect. We all make mistakes. But in making those mistakes, we don't let that get in the way of what Jesus wants us to do here when he says to follow me. And this morning, we're going to talk about following in the footsteps of Jesus. I can't go back in time and actually follow in his steps. And I'm going to tell you what, I'm glad I can't. Physically, some of the things that he went through, I want no part of. But I can follow the example that he has given to us. Consider these scriptures with me. John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. One of the great things about shepherding in that day and time, and, and there are still in certain parts of the world where this is still done. At night, when they gather the sheep into an area that they're corralled together and there's one gate in and one gate out, and that's for protection, there may be four or five different herds in this one area. And I immediately, my thought would come to mind, well, how did they get them separated the next morning so that everybody gets their sheep? You know how they do it? Well, they put tags on their ears. One's red, one, no, they don't. The shepherd goes to the entrance of the gate and he calls to his sheep and they know their shepherd and they follow him. So one at a time, four separate groups and those sheep follow their shepherd. They hear my voice and I know them in a the sense they know me and they follow me. And that's for us as well today. Do you know him? Do you know him and are you following him as he wants us to do? Matthew chapter 4, beginning with verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon Peter, uh, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers of fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and they followed him. Interesting story here. Would you just stop what you were doing? Their job, their livelihood, how they supported themselves, how they supported their family. And Jesus says, follow me. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. How many of you would do that? But in essence, that's what Jesus is telling us to do today. That the most important thing that you can do today is not worry about everything else, but follow after him. Because we're all fishers of men, aren't we? The Bible goes on to say, Matthew chapter 19, and we're just going to read a little bit of it here. Jesus said to him, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. Verse after verse where the Bible gives this idea where Jesus is saying, follow me. John chapter 21. He spoke this signifying what death that he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto them, follow me. And more verses we could go through. But the idea is that these texts clearly show us of what one can and one, what one cannot do to follow Jesus in this life. And only following Jesus can lead us to eternal life. Folks, you can't get to heaven any other way. The world says you can get to heaven any way you want. The Bible says there is one way to the Father. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except 
through me. John chapter 14 and verse 6. I can't make it any clearer than that. I'm not asking you to believe me. I'm asking you to believe the Bible. I'm not asking you to believe somebody you heard on television. I'm asking you to believe the Bible. I'm not asking you to believe some kind of family religion that's been a tradition in your family for generation after generation. Unfortunately, I know of families that are going to be eternally lost because they were so rooted in tradition that they refused and were blinded to the reality of what the scriptures say. And the Bible says that the only way we can get to heaven is by following after Jesus. There's salvation, no salvation in any other name which is given whereby we must be saved. Folks, that verse should mean something to us. That we follow his example. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 21 will lead us into what we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, for where you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And we can do that. And here are some of the things that the Bible says very quickly that we should be doing so that we can say we're following after Christ. We follow Jesus, number one, in love. John chapter 13 and verse 34. We truly do not love until we love like Christ loved. You say, oh, I love my family. As well you should. But the Bible says that we're to love our neighbor as ourself. The first great commandment, love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. The second is like it in that you love your neighbor as yourself. And to be like Christ, we must follow in his steps in regards to how Jesus loved we're supposed to love. I'm going to tell you what, it was hard for me on Saturday to love. I went to a store on Saturday and people were shoving and people were pushing and people were grouchy and people were mean and I got in the car and my wife looked at me and she said, you're mean. And I was. Because I let the environment dictate how I was going to be in that moment. I don't like to be shoved. I don't like to be pushed. I don't think looking over an item and fighting over it is the way that we ought to conduct ourselves. But we've become so materialistic in our life that this weekend after Thanksgiving is something we think that we all have to do. I talked to a guy on Friday who was in retail and he said, this whole Black Friday thing is a hoax. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, there are some deals out there, but the best deals are the week before Christmas. And he said, we have trained people to think that it, because it's Black Friday, but Black Friday has created an environment to where we're not nice to people. And the Bible talks about loving all mankind, showing your love. Yes, I beeped my horn at somebody Saturday. It wasn't road rage, it was, I'm not gonna say it. Number two is compassion. See who I'm preaching to this morning? See, I'm a fair opportunity preacher. <laughs> I know when to hit myself a few times too. And to have the compassion is Christ. The one thing through, throughout the theme of Jesus' life is he had compassion on people. When he saw somebody hurting, he helped them. And if he couldn't help them, he made a way. Well, he could always help them. But the stories that we're told and we see the story of the, good, of the Good Samaritan and the idea of having compassion for people along the way and helping people. And that we have that same kind of compassion in our life. Number three, humility. Boy, here's a hard one, isn't it? Humility, oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. 
And you know the rest of that song, but you don't have to sing the rest of that song because the truth in the first part of that. We have a hard time with humility in our life. And we go back to the verse that we read a moment ago when Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. That it's not about you, it's about him. And it's still that way today. Brethren, it's not about us, it's about him. It's about what we're doing for him. It's about the message that we're giving the, a lost and dying world. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. And to have that kind of humility in our lives that if it's not about me and it's about him, then it might be about others above me as well. I mean, we live in a society today that says it's all about you. That it's all about you as an individual. You deserve this and you deserve that. Brethren, we're raising a generation, maybe we've already raised a generation, that is more concerned about what they think they deserve needs to be given to them versus going out and working, as the Bible would tell us to do, to earn the things that we have in our life. And there are people that have carried that over into religion who believe that when I stand before God, I wouldn't have to done anything. It's just going to be given to me. And that is foreign to the Bible. Bible. That the Bible says, no, you can't earn your salvation, but there are things that if we're going to be faithful and we're going to follow in the steps of Jesus, that we're going to do in our life to help ensure us that we will be saved on that great day. Humility is saying, I can't do this by myself. I need Jesus Christ. Number four, speaking as God commanded, the world has a problem with that. I think we understand what that one means. And to work, and to work in the church, and to work into our lives, and, and to be an example to people. You're not going to lead many people to Christ by accident. And I know there are some who say, well, uh, there are people always watching, and I can lead by my example. Yes, there are. And there are examples like that. But it takes work. It takes work in our own lives to make sure that we as an individual are being what we need to be, as well as going out and working to teach the gospel to the lost. The harvest is plenty and the workers are what? Few. They're few. And I can relate to that since being married to Renee and her dad and her brothers are farmers. And when it comes time to bring in the harvest, and I've been there, and I try to be there every time it's, it's time to harvest because I know the amount of work that it takes to get that harvest in. It's, oh, we've got modern day equipment. Yeah, there's modern day equipment, but there's still a lot of work that goes in to bringing in the harvest. And when I go there and I'll spend two or three days there, I'll tell you what, when it's time to come home, she has to drive because I'm worn out. And it's the same thing in the idea of working in Christianity. The harvest is plenty. Folks, I believe the fields are ripe right now. I believe that every time that there is an election, every time there is a change of power in our nation, that the harvest becomes even wider than it was before because it seems that something triggers in people's minds that, oh, well, maybe there is something greater than politics. And there is. And that's a relationship with God. And that's faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And that we work at those things. Seek the lost. It goes right along with it. Do you seek the lost? You ever think about that for a moment? Seek the lost. You remember the woman and the coins? She had the coin and she lost her coin. What did she do? In my language, she turned that place upside down. Because she wanted to find that coin. You may remember the story of the shepherd who had the hundred sheep. Ninety-nine were safe and he lost one. What did he do? He left the ninety-nine exposed to go after him. And I love the picture of that is when he found that one lost sheep, he throws him up over his shoulders and he carries him home. And brethren, that's how I see it when somebody comes to the Lord. Is Jesus picks them up and carries them home. To seek the lost is to seek something that is so precious to us that we'll turn our lives upside down so that we can reach them in some way to get them to see the need for Jesus Christ in their life. When was the last time you did that? 
When was the last time you disrupted your very life to go after somebody that was lost? Because the plan in the Bible, the idea in the Bible says that if we truly seek the lost and know who they are and go after them, we'll bring some to Christ. All of them? No. But we cannot fulfill the great commission to go into all the world and think that doing Sunday morning worship is everything that's required of each and every one of us. And folks, that simply just isn't so. I love Sunday morning worship, don't you? I enjoy singing and I enjoy scripture and I enjoy preaching and I enjoy the fellowship that we have. And I can't wait till it's like this every day when we're all in heaven together. But the rest of the time, we need to be working as Christians. We're not going to grow like we can if each and every one of us aren't out there working, seeking to save that which is lost. You know, we've spent this whole year And I haven't preached on it a whole lot, and maybe I should have. I don't know. I just didn't want to beat you on top of the head. We've spent this whole year where our focus was every family bringing somebody to Christ. Now, I'm not disappointed. How many baptisms we've had this year? Anybody have any idea? We've had nine. And if we would have only had one, it would have been worth the effort. Amen? Yes, it would have been. My point is this. Where has your focus been for all of this year? Have you truly tried to seek that which was lost and bring somebody to Christ? Maybe it's you that needs to be brought to Christ. And I'm not just talking about baptism. I'm talking about those that have fallen away. Those that have gone back into the world of sin. How about them? Isn't their soul just as precious as a new convert into Christ? Absolutely. And what have we done there? I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm trying to get us to understand of how significant it is when the Bible talks about seeking the lost. And the responsibility that falls upon each and every one of us as Christians to be generous like Jesus was generous. Oh, I wish I could get this. Oh, I feel so bad sometimes when I read in the Bible how generous Jesus was. I wish, I wish, and I pray often, Lord, help me to be generous like you. And I'm not talking just about physical things, though that's important as well. To be generous like Jesus and to have true obedience like Jesus and to hate sin. Iniquity is a fancy word for sin. God hates sin. Do we? Censorship is gone in America. If you don't believe me in that, go to a movie sometime. Our family tradition at Thanksgiving is we always go to a movie on Thanksgiving Day. That's been a tradition that we've had since Kayla was very, very little, and I enjoy doing that. You know, if nothing else, I get a pretty good nap while I'm there, and I appreciated Mark and Lisa's post about <laughs> an expensive nap, but well worth it because of the memories. But some of the, even the rating system in movies will mislead you into thinking, well, this is going to be clean. And the next thing you know, you're looking at your wife saying, you pick this. <laughs> but where censorship is gone, that we're being, our minds are being hardened to the idea of what the Bible will call sin, society now says is acceptable. And folks, there's the hard part of living in the world and not being of the world is that we don't let our censorship go away and to leading us into believing what just because the world says it's all right doesn't mean it's all right. And there are things that we really need to be on our guard for. But to follow Jesus, these are the things that we need to do. Jeff, I'm going to skip the rest of these PowerPoints so you can get us to the invitation song here in a moment. Are you following Jesus? 
Really? As we sing this invitation song, I want you to look inside yourself like you never have. And consider some of these things that we have talked about. And to consider John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. I pray this morning, if you need to obey the gospel, you'll do that. I pray this morning that if you're an erring Christian or you have sin in your life, I pray with everything that's in me that you'll make that right today as we stand and as we sing.